Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Frankly Speaking on Friday's podcast. I am your host, Frank Bedore. It is currently, what, April? <laughs> yes, it is April 22nd, 8.41 p.m. Eastern Time. And it's been a long two weeks, hasn't it? It has been a long two weeks. A lot of development and a lot of things to share. I'll do my best in which to keep it brief so that we can go ahead and get on to a topic that I've been wanting to discuss, but at the same time have never known a way in which to approach it, nor how to go about discussing it. But I think I found that approach. But two weeks have gone. What have you done? What have you been up to? What have you accomplished? Where have you fell short? What things have you done for fun? Did you go anywhere? Did you... Did you just stay still for a while and you felt like, you know, now is not the time. Now is not the week. Now is not the couple of weeks. That's okay. That's quite all right. We all have those moments, those weeks, those months where doing something just kind of isn't feasible with where you are. And I've been there before. I've done, I did that for months. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. The thing is that you want you have to want to go towards that light. And I believe you can. I know you want to. There's a lot more to this world than to just do nothing, as inviting as that may seem. So, with that said, no matter what you accomplished without these two weeks, I'm proud of you. I know you can do more. Little by little, work yourself up to it, but I know you can do more. Okay? So, with that said... Here is to you, here is to the podcast, and episode 29 of the Frankly Speaking on Fridays podcast. Prost. So, let's get real quick to the update, my weekly update to you. Or I guess at this point it would be a couple of week update. But... <clears throat> Mostly, I just want to share a couple of things before we dive into the actual topic of the podcast. Last week, Good Friday, I began my new job. Which, again, I'm not going to relay or discuss exactly what it is, but it is through insurance. So I had a very good day, very good second day on Monday. And on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, these past... Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I was in a three-day course trying to uh, pass a three-day course of, um, of learning about casualty and property insurance. And it's quite eye-opening. I will certainly say that much. And then earlier today, I went ahead and took my state exam in order to be licensed as a producer in order to sell those policies. Unfortunately... I was 6% shy in passing the state exam, which is unfortunate just because that kind of sets myself and I'm sure my boss back a bit, but I'm not really much of a test taker. That's why I'm a musician, a voice actor. I learn what I have and then it is applied through performance, through practice, through an audience, through interaction and mobility. When it comes to learning well over a hundred, potentially 200 page course uh, textbook, material book that I have concerning casualty and property, it is at least 150 pages, at least. To learn all those details, all those policies, all those numbers in three days. And then immediately go ahead and attempt to apply it to regurgitation. That's really not my style. The only reason why I passed my life and health insurance exam the first time was because I had two weeks to be able to slowly and consistently digest it. Even then, I passed it the first time. I don't know what my score was. They didn't release that. So, 
Uh, I now have some time for me to be able to study the material the way that I see fit so that I will be able to pass it the next time. Luckily, the place that took the exam gave me a nice little graph which indicated where I was lacking and where I was good. And there's a couple of things that I can do with general policy knowledge and as well as Indiana state-specific laws that will help me get that percentage needed in order to pass and become a licensed producer. But once I do so, then my job will be up and rolling, I suppose. Other than that, I mentioned it potentially on my gaming streams. I'm not sure if I mentioned it on the podcast, but this past Saturday, the 16th, uh, Avenger, uh, Queen Shelbyst and myself, we went to the Indianapolis Comic Con. We didn't go hunting for comic books or anything of that nature. Our goal was to get uh, autographs and to uh, explore some of the vendors and this and that. So we, the few people from MASH were there. Um, Shelby and I, and some items for Shelby's mother, were signed by Jamie Farr and Loretta Swit. And Loretta Swit was kind enough to also sign for my mother. I told her a story about uh, the television show MASH and its impact uh, with my mother when she was serving active duty for the United States Navy. And she seemed touched by it, and she was kind enough in order to give a um, personalized autograph to my mother for her military service. So, Loretta, I doubt you will ever hear this, but if you do, thank you very much. Uh, I told her about it and over the phone, and she was brought to tears. So, thank you very much. Jamie Farr is an absolute sweetheart and who has aged incredibly. Uh, and then we met more for uh, Shelby's mother than ourselves. We met uh, Ross Marquand, who plays Aaron in The Walking Dead. A Funko Pop needed to be signed uh, for Queen Mom Beast, I guess is what I'll call her. But went ahead and waited in line. Also lovely men. All the celebrities that we met were just absolutely lovely down-to-earth people. And Mr. Marquand was kind enough uh, after the Funko Pop was signed to give me some acting, uh, some voice acting and narration advice as far as looking for jobs, what websites are actually reputable. And he was also kind enough to compliment my voice and say that it was Indeed, good for audiobooks. He was surprised by the work that I already did. So all in all, an Avenger, with it being actually his first Comic-Con, he had a blast. He at least enjoyed himself. We were all very tired. We didn't get much sleep the night previous, and we walked over five miles to begin with. So on the drive home, we were all a little bit quiet, just kind of convalesce a little bit. But yeah, that was the two-week uh, update for me. Not a whole lot in which to share. There's a lot of good things, bad things to go around. Like, I'm still keeping up with my therapy, but unfortunately, as a result of my job for some months to come, I'll have to work... <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. I'll have to work Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. That's fine. That's, that's part of the job. If that's what I have to do. That's what I have to do. As a result of that, my therapy sessions have been cut from two sessions a week to one. So I'm hoping that with this job, getting paid, staying busy that much, and just keeping in sight, you know, keeping in mind what I wish to accomplish with and through this job is what's going to keep me away from boozing like I did from being depressed like I was. I, I will be focused and determined with what I want to do with myself. And of course, actually, uh, Queen Shelby's managed to uh, 
secure a job herself, which I'm still very proud of. And she began her first day of work today. So while she was succeeding at her post, I missed a mark. <laughs> That's okay, though. So good news, bad news all around. Mostly good news. I can't complain. It's been a good couple of weeks. And I hope it has been for you as well. As you can probably hear, I'm a little bit tired too, so... You know, I'm tossing and turning, test anxiety. I don't do good with tests. I just... Ugh, ugh, always been bad. Always been bad. Anyway. Let's move on to the main topic that I want to talk about for this podcast. And it's entirely different than what you might expect me to discuss, but... Every so often, there are nights where I'm in stage one REM and, you know, you kind of hallucinate a little bit in stage one REM. And you start thinking and seeming to be able to put yourself into situations or thoughts which are more um, realistic than what you'd want them to be. And for me, unfortunately, when I come to that state of sleep cycle, I seem to always envelop and engross myself in my fears. And if you don't know what my fears are, I'm six foot one, so I like my space. I am quite uh, claustrophobic. And I do not like being in confined spaces in the dark. And even more so, I do not like being in confined spaces in the dark underwater that is one of my biggest fears you know like um oh god kill bill where she's buried alive in a casket yeah there's no water but that's a huge fear of mine i can't can't even imagine uh people being drowning yeah don't want to i do my best to avoid oceans and lakes and seas and, uh, yeah, like being locked in some sort of confinement and then tossed into a body of water to just sink and drown. I, I might inhale the water faster just to get it over with. I have no idea. It terrifies me. But one of the evenings that I had within the past two weeks... One of those episodes came about me, and I found it very difficult for me to be able to fall asleep. The next day, I was um, scrolling through my phone, opened up uh, Google Chrome on my phone, and reloaded you know, a set of articles that come about, and just to see if anything interesting would come. Something interesting very did come about. So, this podcast, we're going to talk about, well... If it wasn't obvious already, it goes about to slight phobia, but what we're going to talk about is this article that I found by uh, hyper, hyperallergic.com, an article which was published this month on the 4th of this year, 2022, written by Elaine Avili. And the article says, Science confirms that life flashes before the eyes upon death. So it says, it's been an age-old trope in literature and film, but now brain scans suggest it's true. Uh, it's been an age-old trope in works of literature, poetry, and arts for ages, but now science confirms it's true. Life does indeed flash before your eyes when you die. When an 87-year-old epileptic uh, epilepsy patient unexpectedly passed away during a brain scan, the scan found that his brain seemed to replay memories in the 30 seconds before and after his heart stopped beating, according to a recent study published in Frontiers in Aging Neuroscience. The patient, whose name was kept private, suffered a heart attack, and due to his do-not-resuscitate status, the scientists were able to track his brain waves throughout the final moments of his life. The scan was conducted by an internal, uh, international team of 13 neuroscientists led by 
Rol Vincent of the University of Tartu in Estonia. The scientists were originally conducting an EEG, uh, EEG scans on the patient to detect and treat seizures. When he unexpectedly died, the EEG machine kept running, providing the scientists a first-of-its-kind glimpse into the brain activity of a dying human. <clears throat> Quote, this is why it's so rare, because you can't plan this. A Jamal Zamar, one of the co-authors of the study, told Insider, No healthy human is going to go and have an EEG before they die, and in no sick patient are we going to know when they're going to die to record these signals. The EEG brain scan found an oscillatory brainwave pattern in which activity in the brain alpha, beta, and theta bands relatively decreased and activity in the gamma band relatively increased. It's thought that these oscillatory patterns and an increase in gamma waves suggest memory recall. The gamma band decreases external interface uh, interference, allowing for deep inward concentration like recalling memories. Similar brain oscillation occurs during meditation and dreaming. This is the first time this has been proven in a human, although the concept looms large in our collective imagination. It comes back to us from people who have experienced near-death experiences, defined as when the brain has transitioned into preparing for death. Research into these experiences has reported intense memory recall and a panoramic review of one's life. They have also reported a hallucinatory and meditative state and a sense of transcendence and bliss. These accounts cross cultures and religions. The trope is so solidified it's joked about in cartoons like Family Guy and used in movies like Babe, Pig in the City. Babe flees from a dog about to kill him. In the 2001 film Vanilla Sky, the character played by Tom Cruise leaps from a building as he's falling. And as he's falling, he sees his childhood, his parents, a dog, and the woman he loved throughout the years of his life. In the, f in the 1998 action film Armageddon, Bruce Willis' character sees memories of his daughter and wife a moment before dying in outer space. People have been describing this phenomenon for millennia. In The Republic, Plato tells the story of a warrior who returns from death and recounts leaving his body. Hieronymus Bosch's painting, Accent of the Blist, 1500-1504, depicts bright white light at the end of a tunnel, another experience reported in near-death experiences. Previous research into this phenomenon was largely based on the anecdotal evidence. In a 2019 study, researchers compared stories of near-death experiences with stories of drug experiences, finding that ketamine, LSD, and hallucinogenic DMT yielded strong similarities. Countless studies have examined the religious significance of near-death experiences, drawing on survivors' accounts of transcendental and blissful states at the moment before they die. Research has not concluded why the brain does this. For now, it seems that a flood of memories a feeling of transcendence and eventual bliss are one last gift the world gives us before we leave it for good. So I read that article initially, and it's kind of scary in a way, because one of the thoughts that I had was, what if we all, or not even all of us, what if just one of us, is experiencing that recalling of memories right now. What if we're, what if we're currently dying and what we're experiencing right now is just our, uh, life flashing before us, which begs the question, if that is the case, when this flash before our eyes comes to an end, do we then just revamp that flash? It, it does it eventually become like an inception concept, a flash of light of your life within a flash of your life within a flash of your life. When, when do we actually experience the end of it? I don't know. Just a thought, probably very much incorrect, but that led me to thinking myself at times and 
I know several people that I know are indeed afraid of death, so I thought I'd look up an article and be like, why? Why are we afraid of death? Why do we have this anxiety towards death? So I found an article by medicalnewstoday.com, written back in August 11th, 2017, by a Dr. Maria Kohut. And I think there's a lot to this article, which is why I mention it, why I bring it up, and why it's here on the podcast. So let us read, shall we? And as I always say, and like to remind and mention, is that if you wish to read these articles for yourself, they are in the description below. So that you can find, review, read them, learn from them yourself. If you have any comments about any of them, let me know. Send me your comments at fsofpodcast at gmail.com so that we can have a dialogue going about what these articles may mean to you to society, to a larger or smaller part of individuals within society or the world. So, with that said, let us continue this discussion of death. So the title is Death Anxiety, The Fear That Drives Us. Death is something that we all, sooner or later, have to face. But how do we respond to it? Why are some of us more afraid than others? And what is it exactly that scares us about death? We offer an overview of these theories related to death, anxiety, and what you can do to address it. To a greater or lesser extent, it is likely that we are all scared of death, whether it be the thought of our own sensa- uh, cessation or the fear that someone we love might pass away. The thought of death is not a pleasant one. And many of us avoid such morbid musings, naturally choosing to focus on what life has to offer, as well as on our own wishes and goals instead. Yet as Benjamin Franklin once famously wrote, In this world nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. So it is no surprise that death-related worry sometimes takes us by storm. Fear of death is sometimes referred to as thanatophobia deriving from the ancient Greek words Thanatos, the name of the god of death, and Phobos meaning fear. Notably, Thanatophobia, which is called death anxiety, is a clinical context. It's not listed as a disorder in its own right in the Diagnostic and uh, Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Still, this rarely spoken about anxiety has a potential to seriously affect people's lifestyles and emotional health. Health. Thanatophobia, natural or trauma driven. Thanatophobia was first tackled by Sigmund Freud, who did not consider it to be fear of death as such. Freud thought that we cannot truly believe in death as a real occurrence. So any death-related fears must stem from unaddressed childhood trauma. But it was the theory put forth a little later by an anthropologist called Ernst Becker that ended up informing most current understandings of death anxiety and its causes. Becker believed that death anxiety comes naturally to all people who find the thought of death and dying unacceptable. That is why, he argued, everything everyone does, the goals we set, our passions and hobbies, and the activities we engage in, is in essence a coping strategy. And that these are things we focus on so that so that we hmm, and that these are things we focus on so we that need not worry about our eventual death. That is what it said in there. I hope that made sense to you. Continuing on. Becker's work gave rise to terror management theory, or TMT, which posits that humans must constantly deal with the internal conflict, the basic desire to live against the certainty of death. TMT emphasizes individual self-consciousness and their drive to achieve personal goals, goals motivated by the awareness of mortality. Also, according to TMT, self-esteem is key for the degree to which individuals experience death anxiety. 
People with high self-esteem are better at managing fear of death, while people with low self-esteem are more easily intimidated by death-related situations. Some newer approaches suggest a middle way between TMT and another theory referred to as separation theory, which highlights the importance of early trauma reinforced by an awareness of mortality later in life. Another recent approach to understanding and explaining death anxiety is that of post-traumatic growth theory, or PTG. According to PTG, going through a distressing event such as the death of a loved one or receiving a worrying health diagnosis can actually have a positive effect, causing individuals to appreciate the small things in life a lot more or to become more goal-oriented. Death anxiety as a disorder. Although it is likely that we will all be worried about death or a death-related situation at some time in our lives, death anxiety is only pathological when it reaches extreme levels, disrupting the normal lifestyle of an individual. One account of death anxiety, as reported by a man's worried wife, emphasizes how this kind of fear can become obsessive and get out of control. Quote, The fear is is specifically of death, not pain or dying as such, and the emptiness of it, he's not religious, and the fact that he will no longer be here. This is an irrational emotional fear that he has trouble controlling. Recently, it has got worse. He's not sure why, but it has made him feel panicky, and the thoughts have been straying into the daytime. End quote. Who is afraid of death? Dr. Robert Kastenbaum has reviewed various psych, uh, psychology theories and studies related to the concept of death, outlining which populations are most likely to express a persistent fear of death. Doctors Patricia Fewer and John Walker summarized the findings in an article published in the Journal of Cognitive Psychotherapy. One, the majority of individuals are afraid of death. Most people tend to fear death, but they usually only exhibit low to moderate levels of anxiety. Two, women tend to be more afraid of death than men. Additionally, a newer study has found that while death anxiety seems to surface in both women and men during their 20s, women also experience a second surge of thanatophobia, thanatophobia when they reach their 50s. Three, Young people are just as likely to experience death anxiety as elderly people. 4. There appears to be some correlation between a person's educational and socio socioeconomical status and reduced death anxiety. And 5. No association has been found between religious engagement and reduced death anxiety. Specialists argue that more often than not, death anxiety does not come on its own, and that is instead accompanied by another type of mental health disorder, such as generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, or obsessive-compulsive disorder. Other studies show that people exhibiting health anxiety or, or hypochondriasis are also affected by death anxiety, as it naturally correlates with an excessive worry about health. CBT for death anxiety. At present, specialists tend to recommend cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, to people who face severe death anxiety. CBT is based on discussions and exposure, and it is often used to treat depression and many kinds of anxiety and phobia, such as fear of flying. Doctors Fuhrer and Walker advise a six-step cognitive behavioral intervention in the case of individuals dealing with death anxiety. Number one, exposure to fears. Individuals seeking to reduce, to reduce their death anxiety must be convinced not only to express their fear explicitly, but also to identify what exactly it is that scares them about death, and whether there are any situations or places, such as funerals or cemeteries, they, that they tend to avoid so as to not trigger their fear. Dr. Fuhrer and Walker suggest, quote, exposure both in vi uh, vivo and imaginal to, f 
to feared themes related to death, end quote. Since facing elements associated with the individual's particular form of anxiety is an important part to CBT. Number two, reducing reassurance-seeking behavior. This step targets the individual's tendencies to obsessively check their own body for alarming changes, to speak to mentors or respected peers seeking emotional reassurance regarding their death-related worries, and to have an abnormal reliance on idealized health and emotional age aids, ranging from supplements to uh, superstitious behavior. To prevent these unhelpful behaviors, doctors Fuhrer and Walker suggest postponing the target behaviors, gradually decreasing their frequency, or simply stopping the behavior altogether through response preventative homework. Number three, reviewing personal experiences. It is also important to review the individual's personal experiences with death, such as having witnessed the death of a loved one or being faced with their own or someone else's life-threatening illness. Quote, helping them move towards more balanced views on these issues, Dr. Furon Walker explained, may help them cope more calmly with the, pros with the prospect of death. Number four, switching focus to enjoying life. Next, the individual should clearly identify their short, medium, and long-term goals to be able to focus on what they want to achieve in life and how best to enjoy their experiences rather than obsess over their fear of death. Number five, developing a healthy lifestyle. The therapist must also identify and address any consistent sources of stress for the person facing death anxiety or any other unhealthy aspects of their lifestyle that are potentially aggravating the fear. And number six, preventing anxiety relapse. Finally, doctors Fuhrer and Walker acknowledge that even after initial success in diminishing death anxiety through CBT, many people experience a relapse. To prevent this from happening, they say that it is crucial to help each individual develop coping strategies for challenging situations that might re-trigger death anxiety, such as sudden illness or an emotional crisis. Fighting Death Anxiety from Home Recently, professionals from the funeral industry, as well as even lay people interested in tackling death anxiety-related issues, have set up resources to help other people deal with thanatophobia. Mortician Kate, Caitlin Doughty, for instance, founded the Order of the Good Death, which is a collective of professionals from all walks of life who are dedicated to informing the public about death-related practices and, encourage, and encouraging people to, quote, stare down their death fears, end quote. A similar initiative has picked up stream over recent years is the Death Café, a project that allows people from all over the world to organize meetings wherein they explore themes of death. The De Death's Cafe's objective is, quote, to increase awareness of death with a view to helping people make the most of their finite lives, end quote. In order to face death anxiety, however, one must first understand what it is, more specifically, that they fear, uh, that they fear about death. In one classical paper on thanatophobia, also cited by Doughty, seven possible reasons for fear of death are indicated. One, I could no longer have any experiences. Two, I am uncertain as to what might happen to me if there is a life after death. Three, I am afraid of what might happen to my body after death. Four, I could no longer care for my dependents. Five, my death would cause grief to my relatives and friends. Six, all my plans and projects will come to an end. And seven, the process of dying might be painful. Dottie suggests picking up to two reasons that we strongly identify with as our personal rational for fearing death and taking pragmatic steps to address them. If we are afraid, for instance, that someone depending on us might be left in a financial crisis after our death, then we should take steps to ensure that they are provided for in that situation. In her view, in her view being able to unpick the elements of our death anxiety and facing them separately can help us to regain our calm and be less bothered by our fears. Face it or evade it. 
Death and fear of death are often difficult topics to broach, especially when even healthcare professionals are unsure of how to talk about it or also affected by it. As a society, we are so keen to avoid thinking about the end of life that we have started obsessing over ways to artificially preserving life, such as cryonics or augmented eternity, which is a project that aims to create digital heirs able to reason and respond in a similar way to their human originals. There is no clear-cut way of dealing with the thought of our own or others' mortality. And yet we must do it if we are to lead productive lives. What are your thoughts? Is death best confronted with your eyes wide open? So, I'll be honest with you. Those thoughts that I have at night, they have lingered too. Yeah, my, my phobias of enclosed spaces, of drowning, of uh, darkness, all those fears combined into one. <clears throat> but I have had those thoughts of what happens after this, what happens when I die. And it does scare me. Those thoughts absolutely scare me. Without a doubt, 100%, I am indeed afraid of death. And while I am not dumb, I do acknowledge that I am indeed mortal, and I will die one day. One way or another, I will be gone from this earth. What scares me the most is that I don't know what's going to happen after it. If I have that flashback of my life and then it's lights out, nothing else happens. If this is one and done, I kind of wish that it wasn't. Because at that point, it's like, what's the point? Because no matter what, no matter what we do within our lives, no matter all of existence, human life, of the universe, one day it's all going to end. And after we die, unless we created some sort of major accomplishment within our life to have us fully ingrained in the pillars of human society and development within about 50 to 100 years, maybe, after each of us pass, we will be forgotten entirely. And then when the sun explodes or when we kill each other or the moon collides, Earth is going to die one day. Human species will be eradicated eventually. Therefore, everything and everything that mankind has done will eventually mean nothing. So it's kind of hard for me when I think about death and when I think about the inevitable for the human race and for this planet that we live on, it's all going to be destroyed one day. So what's the point? At least if there is something after this, I can at least look forward to, yeah, this life sucks. Hopefully the next one will be better. More than likely it won't be. More than likely. I have a feeling, though, that if that's the case, I will not take my voice with me. <laughs> and that's unfortunate. But death is a... I agree with the article. Death is something that we all need to confront, one way or another. It is unfortunately inevitable for all of us until technology comes along where we are able to be cryogenically frozen or um, like in uh, Doom 2016, you know, Hayden, who's just, it's just his mind and a giant ass robot. Still him. He's just not human. The real question is then, is that really what and how you want to live? Asked all of your siblings, all your friends, no one would be able to relate to you because you would have lived for so long. I don't know. It's 
it's a thought that makes me afraid of death, yeah, but thankful for it as well, knowing that it will eventually come to an end so that I don't have to, I don't have to be the last one of my family to survive or to um, watch all my children and grandchildren die. And all I do is just bury family members and to still eventually be alone. So, I know I don't want immortality, but I'm afraid of what happens next. And I think that is quite valid. Months ago, that would pin me down, but it's not anymore. I have things, I have goals that I'm focusing on, just like the article suggests. And I hope that you have goals as well, so that we can all just march forward with our lives. Do what we can with what we have. And just do our best to be happy with the time that we have. Man, that's all life is. Doing the best with what we have in order to live a happy and satisfying, fulfilling life to the best of our ability. So, that's all I got. That's the podcast. So, thank you all for listening. I hope this has been enjoyable despite the topic. But if you have any uh, reactions, if you have any uh, comments, other articles that you wish to share with me, please do so. Email me at fsofpodcast at gmail.com. And of course, tack in there uh, topics of suggestions, just say hello, uh, or topics of interest or suggestions, you know, things of that nature. Please do so. And like I said previously, the two articles that I read will be found in the description below. I will do my best to be back next Friday. I do apologize for the infrequency, but life is funny like that. And I hope you still stick around and be patient with me as I try to better solidify a schedule so that I can actually pump these out once a week. So, with that said, thank you so much for listening. This has been the Frankly Speaking on Friday's podcast with your host, Frank Pador, wishing you a very good happy week as we start to approach the end of April going into May. And hey, for those of you who hate allergies but are looking forward to the warm weather, I'm right here with you. So here's to you. Here's to me. Here's to the podcast. I will see you all next week. You all take care of yourselves. And until then, au revoir.